Professor Matt Brown grew up in Sydney. His dad was a pedi paediatrician who worked caring for kids with the lethal genetic disorder cystic fibrosis. Matt has worked in genetics since 1994, spending 12 years at the University of Oxford at Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics, before coming to Brisbane in 2005. He is passionate about using genetics to improve healthcare, and so in 2016, he moved from the University of Queensland to QUT in order to be able to partner with Queensland Health and Pathology Queensland to translate research capacity in genetics into the public sector, both for cancers and for heritable diseases. Apart from genetics, Matt also loves sailing and the publication he is most proud of, over and above all of his research papers, is a letter which was published in the yachting magazine, Yachting World. Of course, he's not here today to be talking to us about yachting. Quite seriously, he's going to talk about cancer genomics and how that's changing the approach we use to deal with cancer from selecting treatments based on the organ of origin of the cancer to personalised treatment based on the DNA mutation that causes the cancer. Please make welcome the Director of Genomics at QUT's Institute of Health and Biomedical Innovation, Professor Matt Brown. Well, thanks for that invitation. There is actually a segue between sailing and, and genetics in that sailing runs very strongly in families, so I think it must be genetic. Um, so I'm talking today about uh, genomics and cancer, but I'd start off by just making the general comment that there are a few different technologies which are making really major differences to the practice of medicine that have occurred over the last couple of decades. And the two biggest in terms of disruption pretty much have been imaging, that is MRI, CT scans and things like that, and genomics. And over the next couple of decades, we are going to see changes in the practice of medicine not just in what you'd call traditional genetic diseases, um, but also across cancers, infectious diseases, and even the broad range of common diseases that are actually what affect most people in the community. So this is gonna turn medicine really upside down for its better. Um, and it's something that, uh, we, it's a tremendously exciting thing to be involved in the research and translation of. So I'm going to guess that given that um, most of you probably haven't read the Watson and Crick 1950s Nature paper about um, the structure of DNA, that you probably don't know that much genetics. And if we're going to spend an hour and a half now talking about genetics, a little bit of basic genetics to start with would probably be a good foundation. I'm going to have to turn around to actually po uh, point at these slides for you. So firstly, um, you'd be aware that uh, humans have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are divided up into uh, the, uh, the sex chromosomes and what are called the autosomes. So the sex chromosomes are the XY chromosomes, and the autosomes are numbered 1 to 22, uh, the uh, non-sex chromosomes that both men and women carry. And these are just ordered, uh, numbered in order of their length, so 1 the longest, 22 the shortest. And those 22 pairs, or 23 pairs of chromosomes rather, are uh, made up of 3.3 uh, billion bases of DNA. So those bases are nucleotides that are called either A, T, G, or C, and the sequence of those A, T, G, or C determines your genetic makeup. Those themselves are reorganized into what are called genes, and genes encode proteins, which are the things in cells that actually do things. So the humans have roughly 20,000 proteins, and those uh, 20,000 proteins make up about 1% of the 3.3 uh, billion bases that are made up, that make up the total human genome. And these are called the exome. And until about 10 years ago, people used to think that virtually everything that, um, was, uh, that, that made humans different from other animals was coded within the exome. Uh, but it became apparent the more we learnt about the genome that of course it was more complex than that and that the other 99% of the genome which we used to call junk DNA actually is operational and either controls the expression of the genes or itself produces something else, not protein but RNA. And that RNA is called non-coding RNA because it doesn't code for protein and it has functions itself. Now, in genetics, uh, we talk about, I'm, I'm now going to uh, transition to genetic diseases. You're going to hear uh, people talk about um, 
heritable genetic diseases and non-inherited genetic diseases or somatic diseases. So heritable genetic diseases occur when you have a mutation that occurs um, either in the, uh, in basically in ancestors of a person or in the sperm or uh, egg cells that actually uh, combine to produce an embryo. And so uh, germline mutations affect all cells in the body and are passed on from one generation to the next. So this is what is involved in heritable diseases, whereas cancers occur and some other somatic diseases occur when you have mutations that occur after the embryo has been formed and uh, which will only affect a small proportion of the total cells in a patient's body. And therefore they're not passed on, almost never passed on to offspring. They can be if, they, if the mutation affects um, uh, reproductive cells, but that's very unusual. So we talk about then these germline mutations and somatic mutations. And largely what I'm going to talk about now are somatic mutations that are involved in cancers. Okay, so the Manhattan Project, the big project of human genetics was the completion of the human genome sequence. So um, as Danielle mentioned, it was uh, formally completed in 2000, but as is the want of politicians, it was actually announced that it was completed a few years before that. At that point, they'd really only got about 90% of the genome uh, completed. And it took in total funding around about uh, 3 billion US dollars, of which uh, um, 300 million was spent actually doing the sequencing. It involved dozens of laboratories worldwide and over a decade to do. At the end of it, they thought that if they started again with all of the technology that they had, that they'd be able to sequence a genome for about 50 million US dollars, which means that the Australian NHMRC, if it funded human genetics alone, could have funded 18 genomes in that one year, which was clearly not something they're about to do. Thankfully, technology marched on since then. And in genetics, we have these uh, uh, Dalek-like creatures called sequences, and these DNA sequences have increased their capacity massively over time. So that when I started in genetics in the early 1990s, if I was working really hard, I could sequence about 1,000 bases of DNA a day. So to get to 3.3 billion bases, you can imagine that would take an awfully long time. However, there was a phenomenal amount of investment in technology and that's led to the point where now there are sequences which are capable of sequencing over two or three days, 20 whole genomes at a cost much lower than the, than the cost of the original sequences. So this is the uh, graph of um, the uh, cost of sequences uh, per, per uh, sorry, the cost per sequence. And you can see up here around the time of the human genome sequence being done, Moore's law is the uh, law uh, predicting the increase in processivity of, uh, of computer processes and uh, a similar law related to genomes, which is that the cost of a genome would halve each year. But then along in 2006, a new form of sequencing came about, which we call next generation sequencing. Uh, and it led to massive reductions in cost and increase in processivity to the point where now around about 1,000 US dollars you can get um, a genome uh, done, which is about twice the cost of an MRI. In fact, it's about half the cost of an MRI in the United States, but in this country it's cheaper. Uh, so about two MRI scans equals one human genome. That cost will reduce even further over years to come and it won't be very far off before a genome actually costs roughly the same as an MRI scan. And then the challenge won't be so much financial as, or technical as interpretation. And in fact, the, the slide that was in the center there, which has somehow ended up in the middle of my slide, was supposed to tell you how many genomes have actually been sequenced. So now the, cap the capacity in the world for sequencing um, is said to be around about a million genomes a year and it's more than doubling each year in capacity. So we're getting to the point where actually this is going to become part of a, a routine test that people have. So this has led to, uh, this is a business group, and I know you're here because you're interested in biology and what this is going to do to medicine, but just in case there's some financial interest as well, what difference has this made financially? The, the, res, the answer is that it's caused a huge boom in biotechnology. And that boom has far more than, uh, uh, sorry, produced far more economic output than the cost of the original human genome. So uh, this is a 2013 uh, review of the United States biotech uh, 
genomics biotechnology industry, and they're saying in that year, uh, sorry, by that year, there'd been nearly a trillion dollars in um, uh, output from the genomics industry with a massive return on the original investment. It had created over four million US job years of employment, and the tax revenue to states alone in 2012 was double the uh, uh, cost of the Human Genome Project in the first place. And that um, uh, level of investment has only increased since that time. There's my slide actually about the numbers of genomes uh, uh, going up. This is a log uh, scale here, so that's uh, 1,000 genomes, that's a million genomes, and that's a billion genomes, and uh, you can see that by 2020, it's expected that uh, there'll be more than a, a capability of, more, of doing uh, a billion genomes a year. All right, so what about cancers? So cancers are all caused ultimately by mutations in DNA and cells. So whilst different environmental things might actually trigger a cancer, like cigarette smoking for lung cancer or uh, sunlight for skin cancer, all of those ultimately cause mutations in DNA and once that mutation in DNA occurs, if it occurs in a particular way, it drives the development of a cancer. And so um, identifying the mutation that actually causes a cancer gives you a handle on the basic biology which is actually driving that cancer. So at the moment, if you go to see an oncologist and you have a cancer in a particular organ, they say, well, you've got lung cancer and this is the cocktail that we give to people with lung cancer and away you go. Whereas in fact, we know that lung cancers are actually driven by dozens of different types of mutations and that with that lung cancer in inverted commas is actually multiple different diseases caused by different mutations in different individuals that will behave differently over time and also respond differently to treatment. So if we can actually get oncologists and teach them uh, what is actually the mutation that's driving the cancer, that gives them the opportunity to give you a treatment which is based on the actual biology of the cancer and not just the organ of origin. So at the, uh, the disease area that this has actually advanced the most is in blood cancers. And so this is a slide looking at um, genes that are mutated in the, the blood cancer acute myeloid leukemia. And what we've done here is at, uh, at our QUT laboratories sequenced 150 patients around Australia who had acute myeloid leukemia and identified the mutations that were driving that acute myeloid leukemia. And the names of the genes don't really matter, but basically these, there's a, a large number of different genes that are involved. Some patients have more than one gene mutated, but usually only uh, one driver mutation. And um, the green ones, are the ones which there are tests available for currently within Queensland. Whereas in a research setting, we can do all of these. At the beginning of this year, the Queensland government through uh, an organisation called Queensland, um, the, the Queensland Genetic Health Alliance headed by David Bunker, where is he? Hand up over there. Uh, funded a series of projects to enable um, uh, unit, the university sector, which has the capability to test all of these, to help Queensland Health transition this technology into clinical practice. And so that's what we're doing now. And if you belong to Metro South, you can have a sequence for your acute leukemia done, which will pick up all of these mutations and therefore give you the chance to have personalised medicine for your leukemia. And we hope that that spreads across Queensland uh, in years to come. So this uh, approach can, um, as I mentioned, can allow you to, um, uh, well, sorry, it, it can allow you to identify drugs which work for uh, one particular cancer type. And because they work on uh, targeting a particular mutation, if that mutation occurs in other cancer types, there's, uh, you can take those drugs which we already know the safety toxicity profiles of and use them in different cancers. So for example, Many of you in the room will know that breast cancer can be caused by mutations in a gene called HER2, and that if you have amplifications of that uh, HER2 gene, then uh, there's a drug called Herceptin, which blocks the HER2 receptor, and that's effective, highly effective, for breast cancer. So Herceptin has classically been thought of as a breast cancer gene. It turns out that a proportion of patients who have stomach cancers also have the same mutation in HER2, and stomach cancer otherwise is a very a disease which has a pretty poor outcome. But if you have a HER2 mutation, you can be treated successfully for stomach cancer with Herceptin. So here we've got a breast cancer gene which has been taken because of the um, mutational profiling and is now used in gastric cancers, some. 
It also turns out that some pancreatic cancers are due to mutations in Herceptin, in the HER2 gene rather, and therefore now we have clinical trials that are ongoing to see whether pancreatic cancer, a disease for which there are very few treatments, in fact no successful treatments, um, that whether this actually works for patients who have HER2 mutations. So what about lung cancer? So in lung cancer, until about a decade ago, a chemotherapy was really uh, barely effective. And people did a trial of uh, a, a, a therapy called gefitinib, which is a, a, a drug which blocks a particular receptor called the EGF receptor. The receptor doesn't really matter, but it turns out that, so in those original trials, they did these trials and the gefitinib did not work. However, subsequent to that, people realized that a small group of patients, and in particular people who did not smoke, actually did respond to gefitinib. And when they looked at those patients molecularly, it turns out that they had mutations in the receptor that gefitinib blocks, the EGF receptor. And so when they then stratified the patients according to whether or not the patient had a mutation in the receptor or not, or they did, and, the, and the not as the green line, the wild type people here, the patients who had the mutation in the receptor actually responded pretty well to gefitinib. And so now, if you have lung cancer, all lung cancer patients have their uh, tumor sequenced. If they have a mutation in the EGF receptor, they get treated with gefitinib or uh, a, a descendant of gefitinib. So mutational profiling here has led to the rescue of a drug which is now first line treatment for lung cancer. So lung cancer, as it turns out, has got multiple different forms which are characterized by different mutations in different genes. And it depends the types of mutations that you get. So each sector here represents mutations in a different gene. And these are non-smokers or never smokers, and these are uh, uh, smokers. You can see that the colors in the, of, in the sm never smokers are quite different to those in the smokers. So, so nowadays, uh, or, sorry, prior to the mutational profiling, people who were non-smokers and smokers would get treated with the same uh, cocktail of drugs. Now what happens is that uh, we sequence the tumors, we work out what the mutations are, and then you're treated according to, at least partly, according to what the mutations are in the, in the tumors themselves. And since there are roughly 12,000 lung cancer patients diagnosed annually in Australia, this is resulting in a really major shift, a shift in um, medical practice in oncology. All right, so um, I'm coming to the end of my talk here. I mentioned about the Queensland Genetic Health Alliance uh, program. Uh, so uh, at QUT, my group moved to QUT to partner with Pathology Queensland and Metro South to provide these services for uh, Metro South patients. So in Metro South, at least, uh, if you come with a, a life-threatening malignancy, that malignancy will be able to be sequenced free of charge. And uh, courtesy of our research capability, we'll be able to tell the clinicians what the driver mutations are that are causing that tumor, and people will be able to have personalized medicine for it. We'll, we hope that this is something that over time becomes available broadly through Queensland. And that's my uh, research team there, um, which uh, includes, uh, we have people who cover not just the sequencing aspect, the analysis aspect, and also Aideen McInerney, who's going to be presenting later, who helps us with consenting all of the patients for the, uh, for the sequencing. I'll stop there. Thank you.